If you concede that the world has not been created out of Brahman, but assert that it is an appearance based on the reality of Brahman, then indeed it does not exist and Brahman alone exists. It is like dream. In a state of ignorance, the intelligence within oneself appears as numerous dream objects, all of which are nothing other than that intelligence. I suppose that's, a, that's quite an interesting way of describing dreams, isn't it, as aspects of intelligence. There's something going on there. There's something going on in dreams. There's uh, something being acted out. And I think it's as good a word as any to describe it as intelligence. Even so, in what is known as the beginning of creation, such an appearance happened. But it is not independent of Brahman. It does not exist apart from Brahman. Hence, it does not exist. And, you know, along with this question, why, we, we have categories of existence and non-existence. And again, do we, do we need to actually make these classifications? I mean, what, what does a, what's a dream made up of? Do dreams exist? Do emotions exist? If an emotion exists, but what is it? Is it something we can look at? Is it a feeling? And what's jealousy? Does jealousy exist? Where does it exist? If jealousy exists, where does it exist? Does it exist in the heart? Does love exist? Does love exist in the heart? If we open a heart, will we find something called love? What is existence? Anyway, um, I could go on with I could go on for quite a while like that, but let's just press on with Yoga Vasishta. Rama said, "Holy sir, if that is so." How is it that this world has acquired such a sense of reality? That's a better question. As long as the perceiver is, the perceived exists, and vice versa. And only when both these come to an end is there liberation. So this is another uh, dichotomy that we invent, the perceiver and the object of perception. Um, this way of thinking is often described as an unliberated way of thinking. <clears throat> but again, it's just part of the cognitive process. They don't come to an end. What we can do is realise how we've constructed the perceiver and the perceived. If there is a clean mirror, it reflects something or other all the time. Even so, in the seer, this creation will again and again arise. However, if the non-existence of creation is realised, then the seer ceases to be. But such a realisation is hard to get. So, Rama here is um, going over the indications of enlightenment. He's, under, he's, he's, he's given an account of his understanding of enlightenment here. Um, the, it's like he says the seer ceases to be. Um, it's not as if the seer disappears from existence. Again, this kind of language has given rise to rather silly notions about people getting enlightened and disappear, or the world disappears or the <clears throat> enlightened being disappears from this plane of existence. It's not like that at all. It's just that all the um, erroneous <clears throat> ways of, of looking at things become corrected. The viewpoint changes and they, they, we're no longer experiencing things from the, the, the point of view of what I call the cognitive process. We're no longer splitting up the field of experiencing into notions and ideas and concepts and creating relationships between them. 
But it is hard to get, although it's, it's also very simple. Um, it's, just, it's just a question of hanging in there until the penny drops. The sister said, Ram, I shall presently dispel your doubts with the help of a parable. You will then realize the non-existence of creation and lead an enlightened life in this world. Well, I think it takes the rest of the Yoga for Sister before Rama gets there, but uh, we shall find out soon enough.